Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. Great to have you with us and great to have my co-hosts, Elliot Turner and Phil Ordway. We have a discussion ahead that I think will be of interest to everyone listening. Um, Elliot, please kick us off. Great. Thanks, John. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I'd proposed to John and Phil, maybe we should talk about uh, GLP-1s and the impact we have. And we all collectively decided, eh, we're not doctors, we're not specialists, maybe we should just do a different topic. And in the intervening time, you know, I'd kind of thought of a little better way to approach this topic. And then suddenly, you know, we're sitting here recording this on October 16th. These became a really hot topic in the market from the exact direction we had agreed to record a podcast. So I'm glad we're actually hitting on it now. You know, and starting with that premise, like none of us really are in position to say what GLP ones can or cannot do from a medical perspective. But oh my God, has there been a storm in the markets? And what I'm talking about here is uh, over the last week, the consumer staple sector and the medical device sector subsector uh, within healthcare have all had extremely steep sell-offs. And GLP-1s are singularly being blamed as the cause of the carnage. And for those who may not have heard GL of GLP-1s or are not truly totally familiar with what they are, they are these drugs sold today by Eli Lilly and Nova Nordisk. Uh, the brand names are Ozempic, Wegovy, or Munjaro. They'd originally been developed for treating diabetes, but it turns out they actually have um, very strong weight loss effects, anti-addiction effects. And I guess last week there was a study that, sh that Nova Nordisk had established uh, very strong effects on um, I guess, healing or reversing kidney disease. Um, and then you'd hear stuff like people, so where they're really getting a lot of use is, you know, I think there's something like 4 million users now in the US on these drugs for weight loss. And I, I don't think it's just people who are very obese. It's often people that want to shed like an extra 20, 15, 20 pounds. Um, the effects have been so profound thus far that Walmart has even called out a notable change in basket composition, basket size, and lower units and less calories generally was the quote that they'd had. So, you know, while GLP-1s are being blamed for these sharp sell-offs, I wanted to ask the question, is that truly the cause of the sell-off, especially in CPG land? That's where I wanted to focus this question. The med device question had arisen after we'd formulated this topic, you know, is that really what's to blame here? Uh, because coincidentally, the timing corresponded with a very uh, steep surge, uh, fast surge in long-term treasury rates. Um, so, you know, I'd hypothecated that these things had been surprisingly resilient in the face of rising rates. When we'd had the sell-off all last year, uh, which many attributed to um, higher cost of capital and a compression in multiples. I mean, in some of those areas, you'd actually seen multiples go up. And part of the thinking was, well, these are inflation uh, resistant sectors with tremendous pricing power. Therefore, they could pass on these costs to customers and not uh, face any economic risk. But actually, you know, there's an emergent story over the last two quarters that the fact is, although these companies have very effectively pushed on price, they've had high single digit price gains year over year here in 2023, there've actually been a uh, low single digit volume decline. So there has been a price to pay from these companies perspective and they're losing share uh, to stuff like private label and to uh, replacement products. So the prices of key inputs and the food stuff in particular, they've all collapsed now. So like talking about the underlying costs that these companies have, perhaps some people thought their margins would benefit um, with you know holding consumer prices firm, but input prices declining. Um, but the volume pullback, that also has negative margin consequences. So 
maybe what we're going to see from here, these companies are going to have to make some tough choices. Like how do you, how do you deal with what from here will be much lower price that they could push to customers um, and some volumes that might continue to decline. Maybe you start seeing better pricing, although as is typical for the space, what better pricing might look like isn't necessarily saying that bottle of shampoo uh, costs 5% less. It might be that you put 10% more of shampoo into the same, into like a slightly bigger bottle, but for the same price. Um, so I want to hypothesize that the biggest headwind for the space has actually not been GLP ones. It's been a combination of their own choices and extremely high valuations heading into this. Um, it was a very prominent bond po proxy trade for the past decade where people sought out the safety of staples, the consistent pricing, et cetera, in exchange for bond like yield when yield just wasn't there, but now yield is there. So, um, where does that leave GLP ones in all this? You know, I suspect, and I'm going to ask you guys as well, but it probably has impact and hurts expectations going forward. But it's not the only boogeyman for the space, nor is this the only sector where um, GLP ones can and will continue to create headwinds. Um, right now, anyone who wants to lose weight and has the means to pay is getting GLP ones, though. You know, eventually some people might say it's gone a little too far in who's using them. I went on one of the sell side brokers, uh, KOL calls about the space. He was a doctor who specializes in obesity, and he was arguing very strongly that there are concerning side effects ranging from sarcopenia to stomach pains and mental health problems that can be caused by these drugs where the risks greatly outweigh the rewards for people who just want modest weight loss. So maybe the, the rage is going a little too far. Uh, I don't know. So, you know, one of the things I want to ask you all is what do you think is causing the pain in staples? Uh, what do you think about the volume price trade-off? What do you think about the uh, impact of GLP ones? Does it, or does it not have an impact? What do you think about valuations? And then, you know, I'll bring up one company. I was like mining through the rubble of the CPG space. Uh, McCormick was one that stood out to me as kind of interesting. It had been crushed in all this. They make spices. I don't necessarily see how GLP ones would change the demand outlook for spices because people still eat. Maybe you want uh, to make some case, you know, there's less volume at the margin, but my God, this thing's down as much as anything that you, that you could definitely see an effect. Uh, but what stood out to me is like, if you looked at all these companies, their valuations inflected upward in like 2013, 2014 period, when low rates became the longer term expectation. But unlike the other companies, McCormick actually had an inflection in their free cash flow per share growth. They went from, you know, very modest, uh, you know, low single digits growth to double digit growth in that time. So maybe there was something different in the business. So the last question I tack on to my others is do any companies stand out as interesting uh, or any areas? So let me throw it out there and then we'll see where this goes. Yeah, I I would say I'll respond with a bunch of thoughts and we can pull at each one individually. So I certainly don't know anything that even remotely qualifies me to comment on the scientific validity or lack thereof of the GLP ones and what the medical implications are. I, I mean, the first thought that always jumps to my mind in this kind of situation is the law of unintended consequences. And you certainly hope that this category of drugs falls into the the same realm as, you know, Tylenol or penicillin or something that has relatively minor to almost non-existent consequences and side effects. Um, but I think it's probably too early for anybody to draw, you know, any conclusions along those lines, just because these drugs haven't been tested over a long enough period yet. And they're kind of a new tag. I did, it's interesting. I don't think they, anyone should be discouraged that this was an, uh, intended for, diabetes and is, is proving to have lots of other beneficial uh, outcomes because that's often how new drugs are discovered, right? So that's a good thing. And, uh, you know, we certainly need something along these lines because the the medical and the human costs um, in this area are, are massive. So I, I did notice last week, I read the DaVita uh, press release from their ch chief medical officer because, you know, that's where it gets really crazy is the 
consequences are massive for something like this. You know, not just companies that make sugary snacks, but companies that do kidney dialysis and and everything in between. And Davida, in my opinion, was kind of equivocating about what their response was on this. But yeah, I mean, to your point, Elliot, I think the stock was down 15 or 20% in a day. Uh, so, you know, people are paying a lot of attention to this. As to the proximate cause or causes, I would say you hit on it for the most part. I, you know, the, the, the bond proxy trade is over or should be over because you can now get 5% in a money market fund and dividends have always been stupid. And as everyone listening to this probably knows, we should ban the term dividend in favor of liquidating distribution. And if we did that, people would realize how stupid it was to pay for you know, some CPG company that had a 2.5% dividend yield that may or may not have been well covered, may or may not have had any rational basis in the, the principles of capital allocation or even common sense, just because interest rates were much, much lower. And uh, that game is over. That game should have been over from the beginning, but that's not how people sometimes vote and sometimes work. So I, I get it. But that that would definitely make no sense whatsoever. And you're right. I mean, it's fascinating. I mean, the one overarching thought I've had about the a lot of the CPG companies is they generally don't have a great track record. I mean, look, some of them are benign. Some of them, you know, whether it's McCormick, I don't I don't know anything about McCormick necessarily but you know there's lots of companies and it would fall into that category that don't make junk but there's a lot of companies that make junk right stuff that's just not very good for you stuff that's just very cynically marketed and uh, again i'm not any sort of health food nut or anything like that and i think if you go the other direction and take this view that all of quote big food is a conspiracy against the layman and is bad for you and horrible you've probably gone too far in that direction as well but i think the fact remains that these health, these trends towards a more health conscious diet away from some of the products that the CPG companies came up with and marketed a hundred years ago up through the last five or 10 with enormous success that, you know, some of the most well-named brands, well-known name brands in the world. I think that is definitely not a fad. That is a trend that will persist. In my opinion, I would be very, very surprised if these companies do not continue to face pretty significant volume issues over the next two, five, 10, 20 years. I just don't see that reversing for any good reason. I, you know, there, there are reasons I could be wrong. There are surprises along the road. I wouldn't want to make a big binary bet on that, but I would be surprised if we don't wake up, you know, down the road and see that that trend has continued. So those are my initial thoughts and I'll stop there and we can pull on each one individually. I couldn't help but think, like, as you were saying that, all my brain kept going to was like, my God, Smucker buying Hostess Brands right now, whose stock ticker is after its, like, flagship product, Twinkies. Right. I was like, it sounds like you're talking directly about that product in particular. I, Though I know was you're not. Much broader. I, <laughs> I, I know was you're not. not. Yeah. yeah, that's where it's like, you know, I'm not trying to preach about no one should ever eat a Twinkie. Like, I eat junk food occasionally, too. But, you know, it's also pretty hard to say that. Twinkies are some awesome thing and, you know, they're going to have a bigger market five or 10 years from now, which is kind of one of the tests that I always look at for an investment, right? So I'm not trying to forecast this quarter's earnings or this year's earnings or anything, any metric over that kind of time horizon. So one of the things I have to consider right away is, will this company exist in five to 10 years? Because by the nature of the valuation, it has to be around to give me any sort of margin of safety to earn back the price I'm paying today. And related is how likely is it that this company will be bigger in five to 10 years? How how much will the market grow or how much share will the company take of that market? And to your point, yeah, it's just cheaper. Like even if a Twinkie is a, is a good thing, again, I'm not arguing that, but let's say for hypothetical purposes, a Twinkie is a good thing. You just want a sugary thing. You know, there are other ways to get that sugar fix, if that's really what you're after, right? And white label is going to continue to take all manner of share, I would think, in stuff, probably less so from the really nostalgia-driven brands that have a specific flavor, since you can't exactly recreate a flavor or improve upon a flavor. But uh, I, it's just a tough world. I would not want any part of it. And to kind of like add to that, I mean, it's one thing to show demonstrable top-line growth. It's another when you know that growth is coming 
at the expense of volumes. And that's a big change for these kinds of companies. You know, the, the thesis that they're inflation resistant was that they could pass on price, but not sacrifice some of their business. So if volumes are declining, well, you're probably not going to be able to keep pushing price. So growth definitely has to come into question. And then if volumes are declining, you also have to question where they're losing it. I think a lot of these legacy brands had gotten a little mm-hmm. arrogant, uh, Arrogant on two fronts. One is on, you know, the inertia of their products and and the appeal, which was premised on a certain kind of marketing wizard wizardry. And I think about the effect that, like, you know, with, when I was a kid, Kraft Mac and Cheese was the only game in town, and now it's Annie's because they have, you know, organic ingredients and healthier, blah blah blah, and you don't really pay more, so Kraft is gone. Um, and the other is y- you start pushing price so far that people are like forced to explore alternatives and be like, well, you know, the taste of this private label is much lower in difference than I'd expected. And then you might lose that customer forever. Yeah. Those are really another dynamics. Another new dynamic that's was probably unthinkable to these companies. I know it was unthinkable to these companies 10 or 20 years ago was that some startup would come along and quote unquote disrupt them. And whether it's in the razor blade market vis-a-vis Gillette or, you know, the snack bar market or whatever else, it was just taken as a given that these companies didn't face that kind of threat. And then all of a sudden that threat did come along and the big CPGs generally all responded by just paying up. (laughs) That's never a good sign, right? When they just sort of panic acquire the competition and are willing to pay, you know, X multiple of X inflated financial metric at a peak because they're extrapolating growth or panic, you know, defending their own P and L that's never a recipe for good long-term capital allocation and good long-term success. And you've seen that over and over and over again in this sector. And I don't know that you can stop it. Right. I mean, it's probably never been easier to start any sort of consumer products company uh, than it is now. And I think that bodes well for keeping a lid on prices. And I think it bodes poorly for, to your point, yeah, they've been the, the big legacy CPGs have all been pushing price to offset inflation, and they've seen very real inflation across the board, whether it's raw material inputs, people, transportation, whatever it is, that's been pretty rough. And they pushed a lot of price. And in a lot of cases, they've probably pushed price a little too far to defend margins, to defend the liquidating distributions, whatever the case may be. And if they've lost a customer for whatever reason, because the price went too high, the you know, the health trends were against them taste change, whatever, they're probably not getting that customer back, right? I mean, that's going to be really painful for them to win that customer back. And and again, like I just look at the younger generations. I mean, a lot of these legacy CPGs grew up on the backs of the baby boomers and uh, they're all getting older and their kids and their grandkids generally don't eat or use or consume these products at anywhere near the same level. So the demographics are strongly on against them. That's such a big point, Phil, on the uh, barriers to entry in a consumer brand nowadays. That makes a world of difference. And then I think about how like these companies, even after the decline over the last month, still trade with like higher than S&P valuations on average. I mean, you can find exceptions, but a lot of them I was looking through still trade at a premium to the S&P, which some would argue is fairly high because of the the magnificent seven or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's uh, something that I guess you got to consider if you want to call it oh, dumpster look- dive, if you will here. I'm looking at McCormick right now, since you mentioned that. It's and not yeah, cheap. Just, no, just on a simple gap uh, earnings basis, trading at something like um, 24 times trailing, according to Bloomberg, the 10 year average is 27. Um, so even though it's fallen very sharply in recent times, I mean, it was trading earlier this year, trading at somewhere between the 80th and 90 plus percentile of its 10 year average price to earnings multiple. So, you know, that's not, it's a little cheaper than that price to sales. Again, none of these. It's my problem past, with it. Yeah. It yeah, was the none only of these... one who'd had a business change that accompanied the uh, multiple mm-hmm. appreciation. That was what stood out to me. But everything right. else was like, you know, just up and up, up and away because, uh, hey, YOLO and ZERP, I'm going to buy uh, 
right. you know, every CPG company sort of. Yeah. I think something that's telling too, is like they're on a November fiscal year end. And so we're, we're very close to that. And it looks like uh, uh, these numbers could be wrong. And again, I don't know anything about the company specifically. It looks like they'll produce something on the order of $700 million of free cash flow. The consensus is actually slightly less than that, but the actual results in 2019 were a little bit above that. So again, take out all the noise of COVID, assume this fiscal year is mostly has COVID mostly in the background. You haven't really made any progress. Sales over that period are higher, but not a ton. Like the growth has been marginal. Margins are pretty flat to down a couple points. It's not great, right? It's kind of a kind of a slog. So I don't know. It just that's kind of how I would feel about about the whole sector. And you know, meanwhile, it's got a two and a half percent dividend slash liquidating distribution yield. So I'm sure that's what people are using to justify a lot of decisions that it would otherwise not be held. Uh, about sums up my thoughts. Yeah. John, why don't you I, chime in? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, we, we also got to kind of look at this in the context of how the marketing of these kinds of brands has changed. And to your point around, you know, barriers to entry being a lot lower, there's now so many different marketing channels for, you know, building that brand equity in consumers' minds, it's really splintered. I mean, if you th think back in the day, and this this kind of goes um, in line with uh, the decline of, let's say, broadcast TV and just um, media used to be a lot more um, concentrated in terms of eyeballs. So in order to actually market a consumer brand, you had to be able to make these big buys on these platforms that's kind of you know the coca-cola um time when uh, when they could um dominate um and i feel like the mind share of a coca-cola is a lot lower today than 20 30 years ago just because you know the the whole media landscape has splintered as well and um and so i think a lot of these brands, they've kind of, you know, they were almost like they ran off a cliff, but we we didn't see it for a long time uh, just because they were pulling all sorts of levers on financial engineering and pricing and distribution and so forth. But ultimately, um, you know, I agree with, uh, with Phil that a lot of these brands, they're, you know, they've kind of probably hit their peak um and yeah i don't know why they've been perceived until very recently as these ultimate compounding machines that could do no wrong i mean i remember a bunch of years ago i think people had that view of of beer companies you know basically even in recessions people drink beer and they're so yeah. branded and so forth and now it's like that that perception changed. So I think we're going to see something similar, um, you know, with these brands. And then you layer on um, the effect of um, these drugs, um, you know, it could be um, it could be pretty, pretty interesting how that uh, plays out. But I certainly don't think those companies, you know, are a are a great bargain at a two or three uh, percent dividend yield. Yeah, one thing that I was thinking about too is that it, when there's a lot of things stacked up against a company, demographics valuations probably a little high, sleepy bureaucratic, you know, over, over. I don't know what the right word is, just ossified, you know, old fashioned, behind the times companies. And then something like these new drugs comes along that also would potentially be a big negative. That can be like the final straw. And and that's interesting because it's, it, again, who knows whether these drugs will end up having a material impact or not, but it may have just opened people's eyes finally to the underlying problems that were always there. And it's kind of the exact opposite of what you want when you invest, or at least the way I think about it is that I don't know what the proximate cause of success is going to be, but I want three or four things 
all pulling in my direction. You know, I want a, a good business with good margins, low threat of somebody coming in, blowing them out of the water, a valuation that affords chance for a lot of things to go wrong, a good rational management team that's doing intelligent things with the capital they're generating, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then if something comes along that really helps them, great. That that just ignites what was already, you know, a very well-made fire that was just going to burn healthily for a long period of time. And so this this seems kind of like the opposite in a lot of ways. And I, again, I mean, I just look around and it's an anecdotal thing, but it's also pretty apparent in the obvious. And Elliot, in, in preparation for this, shared some data from a week or two ago. I mean, the volumes are declining, right? So like, at some point you have to reckon with that fact and say, what is likely to you know, return that to where it was previously, or can these companies withstand it? And am I being paid enough as an investor to ride that decline curve? Yeah, that's a really, really strong point. It's like a cumulative effect. It's no one factor that does a company in or, and it's no one factor that makes a stock work at the end of the day. Uh, I think it was from a Mobison paper. He talked about like a confluence of forces that bring, uh, you know, several different kinds of styles investing behind something to make it work or not work. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess GLP ones are just one more really big negative that an investor in this space will have to ask what sort of terminal multiple am I willing to ascribe to this if I just don't know. Um, and especially as, as you'd mentioned, I, I, I thought for a while generational health habits might make a difference. Um, and it had been hard to like pick them up in various uh, like, aggregate stats but maybe that's starting to take shape now um and then yeah, i think they probably are ahead, sorry. I, mean, I no, sorry i was just saying i think they they probably are starting to show up right and to your point just real quickly on the terminal multiple part of it, i mean that's what always gets me in these things is i'm not cynical about any of these companies and their ability to persist or whether people want to continue eating twinkies or whatever you know the more power to them on some level but I definitely don't want to have to take it as a given in the terminal multiple, right? I mean, we've talked about this plenty of times before. I mean, I need to see some level of actual cash economics returned to me over, you know, it, it doesn't have to be front loaded, but, you know, if we're, if we're buying, you know, the parent company of Twinkies or whatever at a, at a level that implies I'm not going to get the vast majority of my money back until 2042 in nominal terms, that's a problem for me. You know, I, I just, that doesn't stack the odds in my favor, even in the slightest. That reminds me of, um, I think, I think it was like Todd Combs with uh, talking about his early days working with Buffett said uh, Buffett would ask how many companies in the S&P are going to be 15 times earnings, or I think it was like a market multiple. Uh, and, and, you know, that you could say with a 90% confidence interval would earn more in five years than they would today. Right. Um, and, you know, like that doesn't lead you down a comforting path thinking about the terminal multiple in some of these, if you can't confidently say they're going to be earning more than they are today, yet they're valued uh, much richer. That was in the context of how they discovered Apple too, right? Which is worth noting yes. that, you know, they obviously not discovered the wrong word, but decided that it was worth not just an initial stake, but, you know, many billions that turned into one of the best investments of all time, because I can't stress enough, as we all know, but it's worth thinking about it, how hard it is to deploy tens of billions of dollars and turn it into 150 billion. Like that's just a vanishingly small universe. And they did it on the backs of just what we described, which is, okay, what's, what market is likely to not only persist, but get bigger. And then, oh, by the way, you need a good starting valuation, which Apple offered at the time. And I would argue this is potentially somewhat of the inverse of that. Well, so one of my other, uh, I cheekily tweeted in this interim period uh, as things were getting a little interesting with the the sell-off um, that the market's treating big cap tech as the new staples. Cause that's where you can, or I, I don't mean like can as in totally confidently, but that's where right now as the narratives are stacking one on top of the other, you could more confidently say like, I, feel comfortable where this is going to be in five years uh, right. versus in contrast to the staples. Um, so any merit to the market seeking out new staples in the form of big cap tech, which I might add the average of them, if you 
ignore Tesla uh, is lower multiple than the market and lower multiple than many of the staples that I'd perused. Yeah, that's crazy. I, I don't know what the numbers are off the top of my head, but it seems like you're probably right that those are lower, you know, just sort of gap earnings multiples or whatever, It's which, which is mind boggling because they are definitely better businesses in the sense of demand, capital intensity, returns on capital, all that good stuff. So yeah, look, I, it's a great point because I think you're right. The market for many reasons, all pretty much rooted in psychology, looks for these narratives of, okay, what's a staple? Like to John's point, you know, even in recession, you know, average Joe's going to drink beer. So therefore Budweiser is the safest investment in the world. And there was plenty of validity to that thought right up until the point that a people potentially overpaid for it and B the circumstances changed. And what was previously a distribution game where only the players at scale could win. Everybody has a craft brewery within, you know, a, 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 baseball throw of their house, right? I mean, there's craft breweries everywhere. There's unlimited amounts of unbranded or, you know, startup brands, white label brands, everything you could possibly imagine in that industry. And that was never the case before. And that's harder to imagine when you're talking about Google or NVIDIA or whatever. But yeah, I mean, if valuation gets to that point, that would be one problem. Uh, but you're right. I mean, look, the, the, the merits are undeniable because you just can't, modern life can't exist without those companies and you know come hell or high water or recession they're not going to go away in the short run uh they may suffer quicker decline than some people think uh that's not like innovation's dead entirely it's not like there isn't going to be new or ongoing threats that emerge but uh i think it's a it's an obvious place for uh you know a, a replacement staples category and i find it hilarious that for whatever reason partly rooted in psychology, partly rooted in old fashioned habits. The staples have always come with high dividends, high, high liquidating distribution yields. And in, for the most case, none of those companies pay big dividends, right? So it's kind of, kind of funny and ironic. Well, John, I think in lattice work, what year was it where actually before he became an internet celebrity, although he kind of was a Chamath, had spoken about, you know, like the age of disruption and staples brands. And I think you had Josh Tarasoff uh, interview Tom Russo about, um, you know, the landscape in, in staples. I feel like that was basically like a, a preview of our future that we're living now in some ways. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember what year it was, but I think at that time, uh, Chamath still had a decent reputation so Absolutely. I, um, at least in our circles, um, and yeah, no, that was, um, I think it was like five years ago plus, um, and yeah, I think Tom Russo talked extensively about challenger brands and the threats, uh, those pose, um, you know, it didn't really affect the big brands uh, in a huge way because they could just acquire um, any, you know, challenger brands that came up quickly just because of the, the scale was still so different that they could pay a big premium and it would still be just a small percentage of, of, of um, you know, the large uh, CPG companies market cap. And there was even a some kind of a um, a chart or illustration showing how these biggest uh, CPG brands just swallowed up any competition over time. Um, I think, you know, they still may try to do that, but I think there's just too many of these little competitors uh, around and with barriers to entry quite low. Um, it's just not a viable strategy for creating shareholder value to just keep buying these companies because you're not getting them at bargain basement evaluations um, either. So they're not necessarily accretive um, to your per share value um, creation. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's, I think it, these these large brands um again they they deserve to lose their status as staples um and the obvious 
kind of replacement are the um you know the googles and amazons of the world i guess so we'll just have to see whether you know whether that is the right call i i i happen to think that we are also pretty late in a very very long kind of bull cycle in the market kind of if you exclude the the drop we had in 2020 i think basically equities have done extremely well since like the early 80s um and investors just have gotten a little bit complacent, a little bit lazy, and you know they just want to have some places to park large amounts of cash, and they're willing to pay a premium for those companies. But interestingly, as as you point out, Elliot, some of those companies are not actually at a big premium, so or even at any premium to the S and P. So you know, yeah, those might be. Um, really good opportunities um although you know i find it difficult to say where basically any of those companies will be 10 years from now um especially now considering um the advent of ai and what that may do to software based uh, businesses yeah, are we really just witnessing kind of the atrophy of the average company's lifespan? You know, I I remember that stat. I think something like you know in nineteen in the nineteen fifties, the average S and P company was like over half a century old, and today it's like under a couple decades. I forgot the exact numbers on that, but it's roughly in that ballpark. Is that really what's just playing out, and it's happening in a new? or not a new space, but but it's a new area is getting hit by it. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, I one thing that has always occurred to me is as soon as somebody takes as a given something that is not a given by the laws of physics, right? I mean, just like, you know, I, I, I'll never forget it. I was always told that I was an idiot for looking at short ideas in 2007 in the housing space because these little declines we had were, you know, random noise, little wobbles, fluctuations that shouldn't be construed as anything because we'd never had a national home price decline ever. It was a it was a law just like gravity that said home prices could never decline across the whole country. There was a law that said you could never have Budweiser's status as a as a dominant beer maker disrupted. You could never have a razor blade come along and disrupt Gillette. And you know that's the magic of learning to invest in, you know, no less a person than Buffett has made massive fortunes in these in these CPG companies by making sure that he invested at the right time at the right price such that he could weather these declines when they inevitably came and no company lasts forever but yeah like i said it's certainly never been easier to start a rival to the big CPG companies and get marketing scale get distribution scale get brand awareness get your product out in front of people and get it in their hands as quickly as possible and it's one of the beauties of technology and it's one of the competing factors that I think helps keep somewhat of a lid on inflation because otherwise I think it would be pretty easy for these big stuffy bureaucratic companies to take way more price than they already would have been taking if they didn't have this competition. Yeah, that is very interesting. I, I, I kind of think that's something lurking beneath it all, but I, I guess maybe I wanted to come back and visit this like the brands do still have, or the big companies do still have some advantages. One that I keep thinking about is Diageo acquiring Casamigos. Like people were wondering, holy cow, how could they pay a billion dollars for like George Clooney's tequila brand, denigrating it? Like, you know, how could a celebrity do that? And they've since turned it into, I think, well, it's definitely the largest tequila brand in the world. And I think it might be one of, if not the largest spirit brand in the world. So like, do you think any of that magic still persists? Like, is there any way that still is some sort of uh, advantageous to position to be in, especially now that maybe some of these, um, you know, I'd remembered Honest Company posited as one of these upstart, like it's going to disrupt um, a lot of the, uh, you know, shampoo and paper companies and all. And it's now 
not having a very good fate as a public equity. So alongside the comeuppance for a lot of tech companies has been harder funding for a lot of these upstarts because it's still not easy. So does that does the pendulum maybe swing back? Was Honest the one that had some pretty well-founded uh, accusations of, you know, basically the science being total junk or was that something else that I'm That was something else. It wasn't okay. really a science thing, but uh, oh, well, just that actually, like they're wait, making. I'm looking it up. They 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 were accused of some fraudulent labels, but hey, yeah, we still exactly. use their shampoo for our girls because <laughs> you know, my well, wife that's... was convinced it's without chemicals and it's better. But that's the whole problem, right? Is like you know, I I forget the exact details of it, but there was somebody marketing. Uh, a tonic water that had a certain level of acidity and then you add a splash of lemon which completely neutralizes exactly what they were <laughs> reporting <laughs> to do and it was just like the most basic nonsense that any you know seventh grader should have been willing to be like wait a minute that doesn't seem right and this is a little tougher right because some of these newer companies make these you know kind of bold outlandish claims that they definitely can't substantiate and that's not to say that the legacy cpgs are perfect either right i mean i think it is in the nature of companies to get set in their ways, get bureaucratic, get stale, to cut corners, to let things kind of atrophy. And so you're kind of coming at it from both sides. I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong, but um, I, I, it's just, it's going to be tough. I guess that's kind of the prevailing message for me, unfortunately. Yeah. It makes me wonder, like they're still, may, maybe if they could acquire some of these upstarts at better valuations, kind of like everything else, perhaps there's some upside to ring out from that. But I guess the big problem, no matter what way you want to spin it, is that these acquisitions are more a defensive uh, strategy yeah. in nature than they are an offensive one. Like it's very different if you're acquiring because you're in a position of strength and you believe you could leverage those strengths to scale a brand into something much greater than if you're counterfactual is if I don't acquire this, I'm going to lose 5% volume a year and I can't afford to have that happen. Therefore, I need to figure out what the right price to pay is to protect my revenue base. Right. That's right. a problem yeah. no matter which way you want to slice it. That That is indeed a problem no matter which way you want to slice it. Yeah, that's the issue. So I, I don't know. I wish I had, I wish I had better answers, but um, I, I, I guess another kind of enduring lesson for me is I don't believe in proxies as a, as an investment thesis. You know, I, I want the real thing. I don't want the imitation. So if I'm, so what do you mean if I'm looking, so like, I don't want to invest in the equity of a consumer products company that has a fat liquidating distribution yield because I can't find anything good to do in bonds, right? The fact that I can't do anything good to do in bonds should be telling to me, right? And so as you start sacrificing your principles and cutting corners because A looks unattractive, so let me take a gamble on something that's A light or A slightly not as good or A different, you know, it just doesn't work very well, right? So you have to take massive doses of patience and discipline to avoid those mistakes. But I just think People that go looking for bond proxies, real estate proxies, whatever the case may be, you hear this all the time. I need income, I, you know, whatever. And it's like you're you're mistaking the goal for for the outcome, right? So you're you're confusing what you need and what you want and how to get it, and and it's just not that easy. And so, you know, I, I guess I wouldn't be interested in the magnificent seven or whatever we're calling them now, just because they might be a common sense replacement for the staples or the bond proxy guys or whatever. I just doesn't, it doesn't interest me. Right. I mean, I, I try to evaluate everything on its own merits and look at it from what it really is and not put it into labels and categories and try to say, well, this is unattractive, but this is kind of like what's unattractive. And so maybe I can hold my nose and do this instead. It just doesn't <laughs> work very well. Well, yeah, you know, you've brought up and we've spoken a lot about how bad it is to shift out on the risk curve and some of the crazy behaviors that we've seen over the last decade. I think that, you know, goes hand in hand with what you're saying right now. And I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, you almost get the worst of both worlds by chasing yield because you get neither the yeah. appropriate kind of exposure to equity uh, and you, you don't necessarily get your yield if um the volatility of these in one month is greater than several years worth of yield. That's what I mean, right? If if it's if there's a decent case to be made that everyone's been chasing these, and let's say they're 15 or 20% overvalued, which is completely normal. It happens all the time. 
and then that comes home to roost, you've wiped out a lot of dividends, and you're not going to stick. Most yeah, seven years of them around. for a yeah, right. I mean, it's just not gonna shy happen. of three percent yield. Yeah, yeah, it's just not going to happen. So. Uh, and you can look at the utilities. That's, that's one where I'd been like this whole time. I, I mean, at least several times on this podcast, I've mentioned, by the way, I've gotten burnt by plenty of multiple compressions. So I'm not saying it's easy or anything of that sort. No, but right. like the utilities still boggle my mind because they just suffered their worst month, I, I think, outside of the financial crisis in uh, September. And yet it's still yielding like one and a quarter percent less. And I'm using XLU as a pro- proxy. So when I'm saying it, the XLU is yielding one and a quarter percent less than the 10 year treasury. And it just doesn't make sense to me. These things are kind of constrained in the amount they could grow it's... and in what sort of yield they could serve up. And so maybe when they were at like 4%, when treasuries on the 10 year were at three, you could say, okay, well, I'm going to get some growth and I'll pick up a percent. But now, like, what's what's the bet you're making in utilities? What are you playing for? Um, and I think part of that is it's a very large uh, retail sector. So there's a ton of retail exposure where there's a lot of yield pickup. Yeah. I just can't How make about sense. This? I mean, XLU, I'm looking at it right now. It's yielding like three and a half, right? Is that, yep. I'm looking at the right. Yeah, I mean, correct. <laughs> again, you get 5% in a money market fund. That's what I'm saying, man. Yeah. So forget about taking 10 years of duration. Like what? I just don't get oh, why. Yeah, yeah, you're saying something I, slightly different. Yep. Yeah, slightly different because it's even better for you as the investor now. I mean, you don't even have to play that game. I mean, to a certain extent, everything should be benched off of a money market fund right now because you don't need to take any opinion on the shape of the yield curve or the future state of the world because a money market fund should be liquid as water. And if you decide tomorrow that there's something better to do, you will not have risk principle <laughs> and you will have earned 5% along the way. And you have no trading costs basically. And you should have effectively no, you know, expenses along the way either. So the, you know, the risks on that end are, and I look, you want to make sure your money market fund doesn't risk any principle and isn't investing in CDOs or something and, you know, some sort of crap, but you know, the point remains, like I just, why, why would I want to tie up my money in something where I could lose money when I could do that and make more money at the same time? Like, it's just kind of bonkers. And so to your point about, like, I think a really good point to tie this all back is I don't see how the CPGs are going to continue to defend market share by buying companies, even at a lower valuation, because those companies are now at, at a lower value, but they don't seem to reflect that reality in the multiples that we're seeing. Right for the reasons I just suggested, which is that interest rates are higher. These should all be less attractive speculative investments because why would I pay to speculate in the growth of some consumer goods startup that's rocketing up in sales volume but still burning cash when I could park that cash and actually earn a decent return in a in a very low risk money market fund? So it just seems bonkers to me. It's a different world today. Very different world. And I don't think people, I mean, it's one of the things I really don't understand about what's happening in 2023 is that we kind of had this massive readjustment in 2022 and bonds got historically shellacked and a lot of equities got smoked and particularly the equities of a lot of previously high flying companies that were you know backstopped by free money and valuations that were totally nuts a lot of those got completely smoked too and yet bonds have continued to really get smoked in 2023 it's it's coming up on likely 2022 is likely the worst year ever for bonds, depending on how you want to define worst. And this two year stretch is going to very likely be also the worst two year stretch ever. And to your point, lots of these companies have gotten smoked, you know, the, the so-called staples, uh, you know, utilities, you know, other so-called yield plays, but a lot of the growthier, more speculative stuff has kind of come back to a shocking degree. And it's like, I just don't understand the assumptions that are underlying these valuations, at least when interest rates were literally at zero, I could understand the, there is no alternative argument. I disagreed with it, but I at least could understand why people were doing it. And in this case, it's like, there's a very clear alternative right in front of you. It's called 5% on your, on your cash. I, I don't get it. I don't get it either. It's kind of interesting. Your growth no. is not going to get you out of this either. So on some other areas, no. you could at least, uh, you know, no. underwrite to some degree of growth and here, not so yeah. much. I mean, there, there are companies that were down 70, 80, 90 plus percent last year because very rightly over that, and they've been around for 10 or 15 years and they've never produced a nickel of free cash flow. And 
they got smoked last year for good reason and, and roll forward to this year. And they've continued to still produce less than zero cash flow, And, but they're bouncing back to these big market caps that imply some level of future success. And I just, it's, I don't know. I can't fathom what it's based on. It's really strange to me. I think the, you know, the market is still hasn't come to grips with what long-term inflation is going to look like, you know, the structural inflation, uh, what are we really looking at? Um, because you get this like conflicting news in the short term, you get some news that inflation eased and then, you know, it picks up again and so forth. But what is, you know, what is kind of the trend line now? How much purchasing power are we really losing per year? If, if you look out at the next five to 10 years and, um, without uh, an understanding of that, it's really tough to value equities and bonds, you know? Um, okay. If you're it not, is. if you're not yeah. taking duration in bonds and you're pretty confident that we're running below, let's say 5%, then, you know, the 5% is okay, I guess. Um, you know, but are we really running less than 5% a year? Um, it's just really difficult because there's no discipline you know, fiscal or monetary. And there's this black swan risk that, you know, we're just going to have kind of, you know, monetary deflation or monetary, um, you know, inflation or hyperinflation at some point, who knows? So just that just makes it very difficult, um, you know, especially like if you want to go out on the yield curve um it's very dangerous so i think it is you know um to some folks then it's better to you know be in equities which over the long term you know and we're talking very long term do provide a hedge and that's where i kind of come back to some equities that um have gotten beat up because interest rates are up um, like real estate companies, um, which, you know, if you look over decades, real estate is an inflation hedge. So I think that's really what the market is grappling now. And, you know, people will either make a lot of money or lose a lot of money being on the, you know, right or wrong side of this. Yeah. And at my point, by the way, was not to imply that the, any of this was easy because it's certainly not. I do not have any clue as to what exactly is going to come down the pike next. And I think it's fascinating to sit here and think about the implications. But as I lay out the options of what is possible and probable, I know that if I buy a 5% money market fund that holds US treasuries, that yields 5%, that has basically no expenses for all intents and purposes and no principal risk and no liquidity risk, I know what that gets me with certainty. And I know that it might not be perfect, but it at least affords me lots of options. And it at least allows me to keep my head above water and stay on the treadmill or whatever analogy you want to use while I try to figure this out and try to keep up with things. Instead, I'm looking at that as opposed to, you know, buying some crappy company just because it has a dividend yield. And oh, by the way, the dividend yields now like half or two thirds of the level of return that I just described. That makes no sense. Or some, you know, big bet on duration. I So stop me if I've already told this story and I'll, I'll end here. But I, somebody came to me with an interesting thought experiment, not that long. It was a couple of weeks ago, I think, and basically said, at what level would the 30 year treasury have to get to before you'd be willing to make like a desert island bet? So you put like some huge chunk of your portfolio or your net worth into 30 year treasuries and go away to a desert island for five years or 10 years, pick your time horizon, but some long term type of thing where you couldn't do anything about it. You couldn't know what was happening. You certainly couldn't trade it. And I was like, boy, I don't know, 10, 12 percent, like <laughs> nothing close to where we are today. Right. And this was some like RIA wealth management type guy who advised all these high net worth people as to what to do. And he'd been like piling into longer duration fixed income in the last year or two. And it was like, he about fell out of his chair, I think, because he didn't see it that way, but 
I don't know, like I, why would I be excited about this level of long-term yields when the short-term yields are so good and it affords me optionality? It doesn't make any sense to me. You know, one thing um, I was thinking about on the inflation question and on some of these equities that have bounced back, uh, I, I kind of totally agree with you, Phil, there. Uh, don't don't want to get too far from that. But like, um, I was asked this question, like, where would you invest if you believed that we are in for a period that has higher inflation but no imminent recession. Like what is the one place you'd want to park your money for that period? And I'd been sent somewhat early in last year's sell-off when rates started rising, the um, old Sequoia letters, Ruin Conniff, the original partnership letters and going back through the 70s and early 80s. And one of my big takeaways from that they invested very heavily in advertising related businesses and had spoken about the correlation of advertising to uh, and GDP as opposed to GDP growth. And then I was thinking like in today's day and age, I mean, holy cow, that might alone explain why a portion of the uh, Magnificent Seven are what they are. Because if you do believe that we're not gonna have a recession, but that inflation is gonna stay elevated, these are capital lead companies that are directly correlated to advertising demand and advertising demand over shorter periods could be a little volatile, but over longer periods is directly tied to NGDP growth. Sure. Like maybe just maybe that's exactly what's going on here. Yeah, no, it makes sense to me. I, I, that's a, that's a whole lot more logical than saying, oh, I want to have, you know, 10 or 20 percent of my portfolio in a long duration bond portfolio or in staples or something yeah which just seems like about the least appealing thing you could do so what would you guys answer to that question where would you be investing if um you believe that inflation were going to be higher but in a recession not imminent i mean i guess the short answer is i'd be investing exactly as i have been because i try to think through all these (laughs) scenarios and account for for all of them, right? So, you know, in, in the case of one uh, partner who has a substantial portfolio uh, I, and that and they have something like 20 to 25% of it in cash and money market funds and very short-term treasuries. And that makes total sense to me. I would have no advice for them as to what they could do uh, on a short-term basis, because as an asset class, I don't see a lot of things that really jump out, but certainly within asset classes, namely equities to John's point, I'm, I'm still, I'm still skeptical that I see any value in longer duration bonds, but I certainly see and continue to seek out long duration equities. And by that, I mean, companies with long tail cash flow generation capabilities where they have demand that will at least hold flat, if not substantially grow over time, where they do have pricing power, where they do have attractive returns on capital and where that compounding will ben- will benefit me. It'll pile up. It'll accumulate to me as an owner. I mean, that's exactly what I want. So I wouldn't change anything I'm doing on the basis of, of that hypothetical. But I think those hypotheticals are super important because you should think through, okay, what would I do differently if I knew we were about to have a big recession? What would I do differently if I knew interest rates were back to go about to go back down to zero? What would I do differently if there was about to be a massive war? What would I do? I mean, all of these things should impact your thinking to some degree and you weigh them all up and you do the best you can knowing that information is far from perfect. It's absolutely imperfect and it's really difficult to get these right. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure about, you know, short-term impacts, but to me, there's a very strong case to be made for real assets to have their day in the sun, not day, let's say decade in the sun going forward. Um, you know, some those sectors have been so starved for capital um, that, you know, there's some interesting kind of supply demand imbalances. Um, and some of those companies are generating very attractive uh, cash flows and paying, you know, attractive dividend yields that are fully covered and growing. So I think if you're concerned about inflation, um, you know, real assets are probably a good place to be. And, you know, just the fact that people rarely talk about them or, you know, we don't really mention them routinely. It's, 
it's just not the place that um, the market has been, but that doesn't mean that um, it won't be in the future. Um, in fact, maybe that that's a good indicator, you know, that those companies could be quite attractive. Agreed. All right. Well, thanks, guys. That was a great discussion. And uh, thanks, everyone listening. Goodbye for now.